Hi, my name is Allie, um, and welcome to the Black Spruce Knitting Podcast. Um, today we have a special episode. I'm here with my partner, Chris. Um, we live together in the Green Mountains of Vermont on Abenaki land, and today we're going to go to White River Junction, Vermont to visit the Junction Fiber Mill. Um, I'm so excited that we get to bring you along with us. Um, I'll put a map here so that if you don't know where Vermont is, um, you can see it's in the northeastern corner of the United States bordering Canada. Um, it's a very small state. <laughs> it's second smallest by population after Wyoming. Um, and I'll also put another map to show you where White River Junction is. It's a village um, in what's called the Upper Valley region of Vermont and New Hampshire. It's right on the Connecticut River. Um, and it's a really cool area. So we're going there a little bit early to walk around and maybe visit a cafe that we like if we can. Um, we're bundled up. It's not too cold today. It's about um, 20 degrees Fahrenheit with like a 10 degree wind chill, which I think is about negative 10 Celsius. Um, so it's a lot warmer than it has been, but it's still cold. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're going to get going and I hope that you join us. Chris and I drove to White River Junction and walked around for a bit before heading to the mill. White River was originally a railroad hub and still has daily train service down the East Coast, including to New York City. The village is a rural community, but it has lots of good restaurants and a vibrant art scene. We stopped at Jewel, a cafe that sells our favorite coffee, Abracadabra. We also walked past the Center for Cartoon Studies, which is a graduate school that focuses on comics and graphic novels. After we walked around, we headed across the river to the Junction Fiber Mill, where we sat down with Peggy and Amanda, who answered some of my questions about the work that they're doing. I'm Amanda Keevitt. And I'm Peggy Allen. And we are the co-owners of Junction Fiber Mill at White River Junction. Thank you. So do you guys want to tell me a little bit about how Junction Fiber Mill got started? Oh, how much time have you got? Um, <laughs> you want to get it started? Well, yeah. So um, I met Peggy, I don't even know, in 2018? I think that's right. At the Norwich Farmer's Market, uh, shopping for yarn from her beautiful flock of colored Corridale sheep. And I was just looking to source the yarn I was knitting with locally, and Peggy was uh, the first person I saw selling local yarn. And so uh, we struck up a conversation, a sweater was made, and then a couple years later, um, we got to know each other very well when my husband Cody and I helped them out with their lambing on their uh, farm. So that was when I wanted to get a little bit more into sheep and there was an opportunity to help out there. So we got to know each other very well. And then jump forward to pandemic year 2020 and the whole world was going nuts. And I decided to completely change careers and start a fiber mill and knew nothing about that and probably never would have done it had Peggy not been interested in going along for the ride. Do you yeah. want to say more about how we came about this specific mill? Uh, yeah, just so I was doing sheep um, and White River Junction, um, raising it as Madison Colored Corydale. I had been in the television business, but um, I had moved away and was doing uh, basically sheep farming full time. And uh, when Amanda came to me and said, you know, I'd like to be doing something that made me feel like I was in the Upper Valley connecting with people. And wouldn't it be cool to own a mill? And uh, I said to her, well, you know, why don't you should say that? Because if there was any mill to buy, there's a mill up in Richmond, Vermont, Hampton Fiber Mill, that does amazing custom processing, but had stopped doing it. And I said, it's not on the market, but I know Michael, we could reach out and see if he'd be open to selling. And uh, that's exactly what we did. We just reached out to Michael and he said, well, I'm not saying no. And so we went up and we visited him. And um, I think what he liked is that we were committed to keeping the mill in Vermont, um, and, and that was important to him. And what was great for us is that Michael sold us everything. So all the equipment, the scales, the garbage pails, and critical to it all was him saying, I will make certain that you know how to run the equipment, and I'll make certain that you know how to take care of the equipment. Um, and that was huge. I don't think we could have, I, I get weepy when I think, but I, there's no way we could have done this without um, Michael's 
um, help. Mm -hmm. Is that fair to say? Oh yeah, and so we went out to see the equipment one day and I think we both just fell in love immediately and also were extremely <laughs> daunted. Yeah, very excited and terrified. Um, our first trip up there, we started on the spinner and we spent hours learning the spinner because that's probably the trickiest um, component. And then we went up for a second trip to learn the rest of the equipment. And um, yeah, we then, then Amanda figured out how to get it from all the equipment from uh, Richmond, Vermont, down to White River Junction, and it literally it was a semi truck um, with with a you know a rigging company that knew how to move equipment, and uh, of course we did it in February. Yeah, our anniversary. <laughs> yeah, <coming up. laughs> yeah. Cue the snow. Um, but uh, yeah, so the equipment landed in here on um, February twenty second of uh, twenty twenty one. One twenty twenty one. It's not even yeah. Wow. Yeah. So the first thing we did was we, we practiced. We got uh, area sheep farms that were thrilled that we were uh, putting this mill back on, on uh, online. And Amanda and I just said, you know, we, we got to know what we're doing. And we did a lot of practice yarn. And then um, we said we'll take roving orders on April 1st and we'll take yarn orders May 1st. And we've been everywhere from slammed to crazy busy since. And I'd say the timing actually although February is not exactly the time we wanted to yeah. move the equipment, um, it worked out really well for our practicing because that happens to be right around shearing season. So we sheared at Peggy's farm and then um, I had at that point two sheep. So we sheared my sheep and I said, I'm willing to put my uh, wool on the line first for yarn. Yeah. And then Peggy had about 250 pounds of yours yeah, that yeah. we went to school on. So we got to learn yeah. yarn with ours first and made sure we could put our own you know money where our mouth is right um, yeah yeah so um it's been remarkable uh, the response from the area sheep farms have been uh, has been really um very rewarding um it's very fun they come in they they look around they're giving us their raw fleece and they're like yeah and then you know we send them a little email saying your your yarn is ready and i just think there's nothing more fun than having them come in and open the bag and just go, oh my God, because this equipment, this equipment produces really beautiful yarn. Can so. you tell me a little bit more about your equipment and about the processes that fleece goes through when it comes to the mill? Uh, so first uh, off, you know, we don't make the wool, the sheep make the wool, as everybody <laughs> knows. So the sheep do the first part, then the wool gets shorn. And then the customer is in charge of skirting their fleece, so that's removing all the little bits that they don't want to end up in their finished product. And then they bag it up, they bring it to us, and we take the wool, we wash it in 185 degree water with um, a detergent, which will remove the lanolin, as well as um, dirt and other, you know, other things. Then once the wool is dry, it comes into the mill, and that's where we get into the equipment. So we have a picker, so the picker, takes the fleece and basically fluffs it apart and also beats out any remaining vegetation in it. Um, and what comes out the other end of the picker is this like cotton candy like fluff of wool that is ready to go through our carter. The carter is super uh, awesome. It's our only piece of equipment that is uh, made by a company that still exists today. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah. That piece of equipment is only around, I don't know, 11, 12 years old. Um, and it, the carter, uh, it comes from Italy, and it the, takes the fiber through it and starts the process of aligning those fibers. So it passes through a series of um, teeth rollers, which sort of gets it all going in the same direction and starts to comb it out. And on the other end, it gets turned, or it comes off into roving, which then gets put in a can coiler which basically looks like a little ice cream swirl of, uh, ro of wool. And then we take that ice cream swirl of wool called roving and we put it through our pin dropper, which is from the mid-century America. Um, and that has been refurbished so that it, and, and as well as the picker and our spinner as well, they've been refurbished to run off of variable frequency drives, which means little computers that allow you to just dial in exactly the speeds that you need things to go, which is great for us because we don't need to know how to change out um, gears and cogs and we're able to hone in on um, making very uh, appropriate yarn for a given fiber. 
So after it's been carded, it goes through our pin drafter, which then further aligns the fibers by passing the roving through a series of tooth um, combs called faller bars. Um, and for roving, we would do that one time. And for yarn, we pass it through um, a second time. So it makes sure that the roving is super even from the start of the stack to the bottom of the stack, which means that all the skeins of yarn are gonna look the same as well. Then we go to the spinner. Do you wanna take yeah, it from there? Yeah, so, so um, we take stacks, uh, eight, usually eight stacks, because we have eight spindles, and we put them on a table behind the spinner, and then they go up and over the top and come down, and then they descend down into to be ready to um, be spun onto those spindles and on the side of the spinner is sort of master control where we're able to start saying okay so what kind of yarn did the customer want and that's where we're determining how fast is the back roller turning how fast is the front roller turning and how fast is the spindle going and we've got a, a nice uh, little bit of an excel document that helps us figure out for that wool and the weight of the roving going in this is how you want to set up your dials but um, you, so that's your sort of starting point. And then you do tests. You're checking to say, okay, did it, did it turn out the way we wanted? Is it weighing we, what we want? Or um, has it got the right kind of traveler to keep it uh, loading onto the spindle correctly? Or is it snapping? Which means we need a different weight traveler. So you do your tests until you know you, you're good. And then you line up and you, you start feeding up onto all eight spindles. And we can do about a half a pound on a spindle, fill it up, and you take those off, stack them up on the top, and then you do it again. If it's a two plier, you now have eight and eight. Hit the switch to have it turn in the other direction, and then you do a little uh, investigating how much twist should you be putting for the ply, because you want a balanced yarn. If the single ply has so many twists this way, the yarn itself will tell you how much, to put the, uh, how much twist to put on the ply. You just basically fold it in half. If you're a hand spinner, you know it. When you fold it back, it'll twist on itself. That's exactly what we're using to measure. Oh, that's how much twist should be in the ply. So we set the dials for where they need to be, and then we go ahead and we ply those two single strands. We can do three ply, which is basically the same. It's just three stacks of eight, 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 and eight, and then we three ply it down. Um, so once we've got it on the bobbin, um, we go around to this, uh, the skein winder, and it's just taking it off the bobbin at a set amount. Usually we're doing four ounce skeins, so we make certain that we do a test saying, okay, we were going for eight, eight, 800 um, uh, yards per pound, weigh it, did we get that? S set it down and then we go ahead and uh, uh, skein wind it. And then, then we're gonna return the yarn to where it wants to be, which means rinsing it, because right now it's been stressed a lot. It's gone through the picker, it's gone through the garter, it's gone through the spinner. So we want that, especially that crimpy fiber, to let it bloom again. We don't do detergents or anything, we just are rinsing it. And that just allows the fiber to go, oh yeah, 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 I remember what, what, what shape I was supposed to be in. And for some yarns, there's a dramatic difference, it really poofs up. Um, so we, we rinse it, we let it dry, and then we have a very cool new prototype hanker so we can hank um, the, the skeins nice and uniform. And that's how it, it gets presented to the customer. Nicely bagged, all of it individually hanged. All they really have to do is put their ball band on it and it's ready to go to the yarn shop or the farmer's market. Or gifts, because yeah. we, we definitely have farms that are ranging from, I've never done this before, I only have two sheep, but don't know a thing, to some serious fiber farms in the area who knew the, the equipment that we had and we are thrilled to be working with um, some of these fiber farms um, who are you know at the fiber festivals on and Etsy. on Etsy, yeah. So, yeah. they have the range. I wanna know a little bit more about like the yarn that you're making to like your own yeah. lines as well. Yeah. And I also kind of wanted to know if you wanted to speak a little bit about like what it's been like doing this during a pandemic and like how it's feeling, like the connections with farmers and kind of your mission about like having local local products and like, I'm trying to remember how you found the website, like interacting with the fiber shed, um, mm -hmm. if you wanted to talk about that too, but maybe first to talk about what the yarn that you're making. That sure. was not a clear question, I'm sorry. Yeah, we can start with that. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so about, Halfway into our first year here in operation, we decided uh, that 
in order to sort of figure out how the business was going to work and also to have a little fun for us. Not that we weren't having fun on all of these uh, lovely fibers we were getting um, from our farmer uh, uh, customers, but we decided to experiment with doing a little dyeing and came up with this line of yarn called Making Tracks, which is a variegated um, marled yarn, which basically means we're taking uh, roving and we're dyeing it in that state um, a bunch of different colors. So if you look at the strand, it kind of looks tie-dyed when we're done with it. And then we put it through our pin drafter and we spin it and what comes out is this really um, vibrant and interesting um, skein of yarn that we've had a ton of fun with that just kind of business-wise it slots into our process really nicely which allows us to get a little caught up in certain areas on custom processing orders and then it also has opened up this sales channel to sell directly to knitters which we ourselves are it's been very rewarding to be able to go to the fiber festivals and to have open houses here where we're selling our own yarn and to do it on our website as well so you know no one's getting I think really rich off of fiber and this is just sort of one way that we're trying to make the business work is figuring out what capacity, what amount of our mills capacity should go to custom processing and working with farmers and what amount should go to developing our own line of yarn. And I should say, Peggy said what she did before this, but I was doing um, web development and I did a lot of e-commerce web development. So it was also a natural fit to um, use God. those skills. Yeah, thank <laughs> God. Um, just to so it's, it's been a lot of fun and what's really fun because of where we're located when we're doing the dyeing, we often have it hanging outside drying and you, you kind of see passerbys just doing this double take of whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, so, it, and, and we try to capture some of the process because the only way to make this yarn that we're doing is to have the equipment that we've got. So it's very different than people who are um, hand dyers who are dyeing hanks. Um, because that's, that's just very different than what we're doing. Um, but to your other issue, just we're, we're loving doing the yarn. It, it's fun to be playing with color, but the, the real uh, heart of what we're doing is to support area sheep farms. We're sheep farmers. We know you spend all year taking care of your animals, trying to go for the breed that you want, for the fiber that you want. And we feel so honored to have these sheep farms entrust us with that end product um, and it's, it's just needed. There aren't enough mills. Um, a lot of the mills that have been established for a while in, in this area, and when I say area, frankly, New England, they're anywhere from eight to two year wait lists. Um, so eight months to two years. What did I say? Eight years. Oh, I'm no, sorry. Eight, eight months to two years. So, um, it's, it's not about competition. It's about serving a demand that's there and um, like I said when, when, uh, when we meet the customer it's, it's neat to meet them hear their story but it's really fun when they come back to pick it up and go oh my god this is gorgeous. I had many more questions to ask Amanda and Peggy but the shop opened for retail hours and people started coming in to buy yarn. It was amazing to see how the mill is already so important to the community. I'm hoping to return to the mill for a part two to this video because I feel like I could listen to them talk about wool and yarn for hours and hours. So I just got home and I wanted to film a quick outro. Um, I had a fabulous time visiting the mill. I feel like I have so many more questions for Peggy and Amanda, so I'm definitely going to have to go back and talk to them some more. Um, I felt like we just got started, but I loved hearing them talk about what they're working on. And I did purchase some yarn that I'd love to show you um, if you're interested. I got a lot. I got, so this is practice yarn. It's the yarn that Peggy and Amanda were making when they were figuring out their equipment. And it's local wool. I'm not sure what breed, um, but it might be from their flocks. Um, I think it's undyed. Um, and it has some vegetable matter in it, but it was really well priced. It was only $10 per skein. It's probably about 200 yards of like worsted-ish worsted -ish weight. And so I bought nine of these and this felt like a really great opportunity to get a sweater quantity. So I got a lot of this gorgeous chocolatey brown color, maybe even enough for two projects. And then I also bought 
three skeins of making tracks, which is the yarn that they're dyeing and making. These two are a new colorway called the Deep End. And Chris picked these out, and I think I'm going to make a sweater for Chris with this as the color work yoke, and then maybe a gray as the main color. And then I also got one skein of making tracks for myself, and this colorway is called Leaves in the Brook. And it's beautiful. I don't know what I'm going to make with this one yet. Um, we'll see. We will see. Um, but I wanted it. <laughs> and I was really happy to be able to support them. I just... I even feel like after talking to them, I just have so much even more appreciation for how much work goes into producing yarn. So I hope that you enjoyed it. I would love to do more episodes like this. Um, please let me know. Um, I would just, I am feeling really excited about maybe like getting to talk to more people who are raising sheep and taking care of sheep and doing all of this cool work so that we get to knit with beautiful yarn. Um, so yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. I'll see you in a couple weeks with a regular podcast episode uh, and take care um, and I hope that you have a great day. <laughs>